This episode of Tea with Jules is proudly brought to you by The Home. You can shop any of the items you see in this episode at thehome.com.au. Jessica May, thank you so much for joining me today. Now, before we start, this is Tea with Jules. <laughs> so I must ask you, are you a tea drinker? I, I'm an absolute tea drinker. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. I recently went to America and I was going, you can't ruin tea. Well, they can ruin tea, but yeah. All I drink is tea, so I thought I'd be fine because I don't have coffee, but yeah. yeah. Definitely what, a tea drinker. What's your favourite? English breakfast tea with milk. New. I knew I liked tea. <laughs> yep, I'm exactly the same. Yeah. So drink the tea, please. I'm going to actually drink the tea. I feel like I've, I deserve a cup of tea yeah. right now. Tea's really good. Now, Jessica, you are the Chief Executive Officer of a company called Enabled Employment. You actually started this company yourself and the whole premise is for people and employers to come so they can employ people with a disability. Yeah, so it really started, uh, I was working for the government as mm -hmm. an Executive Level 2. Uh, which is quite high up in the government. and I, So I was really doing really, really well with my career. And the reason I was doing really well was because I have a mental illness, so I have anxiety. But it meant rather than causing issues for my work, it was an amazing thing because I was a workaholic. Mm -hmm. So I was doing really, really well with my career. And I had my daughter in 2011 and I ended up with something called a postpartum thyroiditis. Wow. which is where your immune system attacks your thyroid. So I had an overactive thyroid and then an underactive thyroid. And is that a result of pregnancy? Yeah, so it yeah. affects 10% of women who have children. So that's a lot. That like is It's a lot. really high. Yeah. So I had a resting heart rate of 180 beats per minute when they found it. So you can imagine my anxiety was yeah. out of control. And it's already hard when you have a, have a baby for the first time. <laughs> yeah. You're already anxious about everything. And I had a really good baby, so I like to be busy. And she just slept and she was never cried. And so... I I just sat there thinking about all of my problems. Right. <laughs> so I got worse and worse and worse. So I wanted to go back to work as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And I asked my doctor to go back to work and she agreed. And so we did something called a graduated return to work program, which in the public service is you go back part time and you use some of your sick leave. But it meant all of a sudden my medical history was now common knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I pretty much went from being a really well-respected uh, woman in the workplace to all of a sudden everyone thought that I was incompetent or not able to do my job. And I think it was, I don't think people were cruel. I don't think it was on purpose. I think they didn't want to stress me out because they had anxiety or mm -hmm. they didn't want to do this. So they just took everything away. So I always talk about assumptions and I think assumptions are normally the cause of all discrimination. And it's mainly fear. People are afraid of saying the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And so they don't say anything and they make assumptions. So that's sort of where I started to come up with the idea for enabled employment because people with disabilities are amazing. Mm. There's 4.2 million in Australia. It's nearly 20% of the population. Yeah. yeah, when I was doing my research and I read that, yeah, 4.2 million Australians have a disability. Yeah. That blew me away. And it's the only minority group that you can ever join at right. any stage of your life. Right. And so it's a minority, minority group that we sort of ostracise, but it's one that tomorrow you, you can wake up and be in. And that's why we sort of say sh we should be doing so much more and we should be doing more in our own circles to make sure that if something happens to us or something happens to someone that we know, that they feel safe and welcome. And so that's sort of what our premise of our business is. It's about being able to disclose safely, being valued for your skills and being valued as a, a person in the workplace rather than being some sort of charity case, you know, oh, well, we're hiring this person because they have a disability. Mm -hmm. We feel exactly for the job. Right. Yeah. And can I just ask, what qualifies a disability? So you, you suffered from anxiety, yeah. which I... I didn't think was a disability. I thought that was maybe yeah. So it's um or? so anxiety. There's a, a big difference between anxiety, like I'm feeling anxious about public speaking, mm -hmm. and anxiety, the mental illness. Right. So they're quite different. So there's a few myths around that. So I actually suffer from a disassociative anxiety disorder. Um, so I went through a lot of childhood trauma. So it means that you disassociate from your body so you remove yourself from a, your body and so how it appears to me is I feel like I'm waking up from a dream mm -hmm. every five or ten minutes or you don't feel like you're part of the world I think the matrix covered it off pretty well right. and, um, and that was based on that was preying on people who suffer from that anxiety that's how they feel like right. you're not real or you're not part of it um, and so yeah that's the big difference like it doesn't go away I don't feel anxious about public speaking I do speeches all the time yeah uh, so yeah it's just about 
that perception, but it's the Australian Bureau of Statistics definition, which is any limitation or restriction that restricts your day-to-day -day activities, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's work or uh, personal life, mm -hmm. for six months or longer. Okay. So it includes things like diabetes, arthritis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I didn't know that because you have a certain you know perception of what a disability is. I didn't know that that. that yeah. Well, that I, I think I, category. part of the talks that I do is really about. Charity's great. I think there's always a place for charities and philanthropy, but I think there's the issue too is um, because they're trying to attract money, they splash all of these views of what disability is mm -hmm. out into the marketplace and that forms really what people think of disability. And so 90% of all disabilities are invisible. So you would never oh. actually know by looking at a person that they have a disability. Yeah. But when you say disability, people immediately think of these categories and yep. boxes that charities fit mm -hmm. people into and that's where the assumptions start about what people can and can't do. Mm -hmm. So I always manage to hide my illness mm -hmm. uh, and my disability. So talk me through it because yeah. it is a, a bit of a buzzword yeah. right now. It's it's one of those kind of mental illnesses that, I mean I say it all the time, I'm having anxiety attack, mm. I'm having it, I'm, I feel anxious or whatever, mm. when I probably do a little bit but not to the point of needing medication yeah. or seeking help. It's just a moment in time where yeah, I'm a so, bit stressed out. Yeah. It's more stress than anything. It's, it's when it doesn't stop. So yes. And like for me, be, I don't have those things that people go, oh, I'm having a panic attack. I don't feel like I'm having a panic attack. I feel like I have to go to sleep because right. it's disassociative. Okay. So uh, anxiety presents so differently than yeah, anyone else, but yeah. it's a problem when it doesn't stop. Mm. So you can be anxious about something for half an hour, but then if you can move on with your life, you're pretty good. It's mm. when it's just a constant, constant, constant thing. But it's the same with any illness. It's just how we view them. Like mm. if you cut your leg, you put on a Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. If you've got a mental illness, it's it's not catching. Yeah. <laughs> and you can get help for it. And yeah. there's medication and it doesn't make any difference really. I think that's the key is that you shouldn't be ashamed of it. You shouldn't be embarrassed of it. If it's really happening, then you should seek help and yeah. and do what you can to and make yourself better. And people stop seeking help because it's so stigmatised. And, and that's what we need to do is stop that stigma mm -hmm. so people can seek help and yeah, fix it. Yeah, You can't fix it if you don't treat it. Yeah. So how long have you suffered for? Um, so, anxiety. yeah, uh, since I was small. So my first memories are things I was talking about this this morning. Yeah. Um, my mum, every Thursday when she'd get paid, because she was a, a single mum, she'd take me out for chocolate-coated aniseed rings. They're our favourite thing. So what what we go to do? They're so good. <laughs> and one time she took me out and we got Alibaba and I got a soft drink. So I was like, oh, my. This is amazing. And then I dropped my drink and smashed. This was in the glass bottle. See, showing my age right. again. And um, where I was there bawling my eyes out, crying so much. And my mum's like, it's okay, honey, it's all right. And I was like, it's not okay. And she was going, I'll get you another one. And I wasn't crying because I dropped my drink. Mm. I was crying because my mum couldn't afford to get me another one. And she was going to get me another one because she felt bad. Right. So they were sort of the early on sort of things. And then I was yeah, sexually abused. So that's when it, it went from a general anxiety disorder to a disassociative one where you remove yourself from a situation. And then it's always been like that ever since. So. Yeah, wow. I mean, I think sexual abuse is the most unfair <laughs> yeah. form of abuse because it's a child for one. Yeah. And they don't have a choice in the matter mm. and from that day second forward their life is altered yeah it's disgusting and completely unfair and it makes me rage <laughs> so my heart goes out to you yeah I, I've had people ask would you change anything oh, no because I wouldn't be who I am today and I wouldn't have done what I've done today I think I talk a lot with my staff but our biggest fear with our whole business is that we'll fail because no one else will ever try again. So we're the first people to do what we're doing in the world. Mm. So we've got lots of people looking at us. So if it doesn't work, no one else is gonna try it. It's not gonna happen again. So it's, we have to make it work. So it's, yeah, it's a really different sort of perspective. But yeah, I wouldn't change a thing. Wow, I, yeah. that's really powerful. Mm. That you wouldn't change a thing. Mm. Good on you for, for living through that yeah. and making it's meant I could help a lot of, of people too like yeah. I, I find it and one thing I talk about a lot in uh, every time I talk with 
groups of people is I always talk about my disability and anxiety and the type I have because some people who have it think that they're going crazy like they mm. think they have schizophrenia or yeah and it's anxiety and it's really easily treatable uh, and then I also talk about my abuse because a lot of women haven't yet and you need safe places to talk to and you need to see people out there who are going great and you, you can recover and you, you mm. can get over it. Trauma is an amazing thing. It either makes you or it breaks you. Mm. So uh, you have a lot of people that it will happen for the first time and they don't get back up again. Mm -hmm. But if you get back up again, and it's the same thing with disability and a lot of disabilities do come from trauma, uh, we're so resilient. Like, we will get back up and we will keep trying. And I remember starting the business and everyone going, oh, my God, what if you had a mental health episode? I don't want to give you any money. It might not work. And I was like, do you realise if this doesn't work or this happens, nothing's as bad as anything that's ever happened in my life. Right. I'll get back up again. Right. I'm the person you should be making bets on to succeed in business <laughs> because nothing's going to stop me. Wow. You're amazing. <laughs> and I know that a lot of people that tune into this channel um, do suffer from anxiety, whether it's, you know, on a large scale mm. or kind of bite-sized pieces of it. Um, can you give us some advice or some tips on how you yourself deal with anxiety? Yeah, so the, the best way to deal with anxiety is something called mindfulness. So it's about being present in the moment, especially the type of anxiety I have because it's just associated where you remove yourself from a situation. Uh, so one thing I worked through with my psychologist was about uh, I'm really tactile, so I really like to feel things and feel their texture. Uh, so if I'm having a panic attack or anything like that, I have to find seven things and feel them and describe out loud like to yourself what it feels like, feel what it feels like, think about it and you do that with seven different things and it brings you back to that exact moment. moment. There's other ones where you can have like a piece of chocolate. <laughs> it's something that we all love. But yeah, one piece of chocolate, but you smell it and feel it. What does it feel like? What does it taste like? So a little lick of it. And then you put it in your mouth and you're not allowed to chew it or anything. And then you have to think about what does it feel like? What does it taste like? Mm -hmm. All of those sorts of things. So everything that brings you back to that absolute present and just moment. slowing down slowing your down yeah definitely, yep. yeah definitely anything else that you can offer yeah get out exercise yeah I'm, I'm the worst because my psychologist is like you should be exercising more and I'm like oh I'm really good at exercising my arm while I drink the wine <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah that's the it's a huge treatment when you have anxiety you release cortisols um, which puts you into that fight or flight mm. mode and when you exercise it actually gets them out of your body and so if you don't exercise, they store up and store up and, and it gets worse and worse and worse. So exercise is a huge thing for mm -hmm. anxiety. And yeah. you would think like they're such simple tips, but they're so helpful. Yeah. yeah. What would you say to somebody who has suffered trauma in their life? Well, resilience is the, the key. And, and, and people with disabilities have it in swags. Like they're amazing. If they've gotten up and they've gotten back to work, they've already gotten yeah. back up and gone back to work. Yeah. Um, so that's what I mean. It, it, you just need to get up and put one foot in front of the other. And um, yes, things are, are horrible at the time, but you definitely do get through them. And I think you, all the things you hear about trauma and things like that, it will never go away. Mm. You'll never forget it happened. Mm. But it, it does get easier mm -hmm. every single day. And you can't help anyone if you're not helping yourself. And I think what, the, one of the biggest cures and the, something they talk about, like the seven steps of happiness, the Martin Seligman stuff, on, mm -hmm. how to make your life better is about helping people. Mm -hmm. So take what's happened to you, turn it into something amazing and go out and help other people. So that's that was the fire in your belly. You were like, I'm not going to yeah. be held down. Life is yeah. not going to hold me back. Oh, I sort of I had a, a bit of a blip there, like because at work after the, that all sort of happened, I got moved under someone else and then I got bullied really badly. So I think people who are those workplace psychopaths who are the bullies they find the strongest person and yeah. then they find them when they're down and right. then they continue so before I left I'd, I'd kept asking for leave to start an able employment and I'd had long service leave and they wouldn't give me the leave and uh, I got accepted into an accelerator that helps startups and and so I was going and then I didn't get in, I got shortlisted. So I was like, I'm never gonna get away from this workplace. I'm mm. never gonna get away from this woman. Um, and so I actually left work and tried to drive into a tree because I was like, I've that you got a- You saw no option. You know, no option. And that, I think that's because like work is a huge 
Yeah. You spend like more time at work than you do at home. And I had two small children then, so I had a two-year-old and a one-year-old. And for me, it was more important to get away from her than it was to think about my kids. And it's a yeah. horrible, horrible thing to say. But when you're in that situation, you don't see anything else. And fortunately, I thought about it last minute, was like, oh my God, I shouldn't do that. And uh, Good. Good. next day I got in. So someone had okay. dropped out of the accelerator program. I'm like, woo! So I got in and it was life-changing. Yeah, no, but, <laughs> but to see somebody sitting here who's been through all of this, you've gotten through it and you can now sit here and tell the tale. Yeah, I think you need to talk about things more. Like if you, if, you, if you keep it a secret, and I think that's where I started the premise of talking about disability. So we all talk about our disabilities and we've recently expanded, well not recently, but we first expanded into uh, servicemen and women who've been affected by their service and we do seniors and carers and like, but our whole staff behind everything represents the candidate groups that we represent. Mm -hmm. but, and I always ask the people who work for me to be completely open. Yeah. Because you can't expect someone to tell you their story if you're not willing to tell yours. Yes. And it's also a way of healing. I think you, you talk about things more. Mm. If you're not internalising it, then yeah. it's a lot healthier. <laughs> yeah. No, agreed. Yeah. So your business is helping people get employed. Yeah. But otherwise might think they might not be able to get employed. Oh, so we, we, we try and turn it around on its head a lot more. So it's more about the business. So we don't rely on any government funding. We don't rely on any charity money. We charge the businesses for our service because you should be paying for a quality candidate. Mm -hmm. In any other sort of marketplace that's about jobs, it's easy to get the jobs. It's not so easy to get the right people. Mm -hmm. And yet this is a whole talent pool that we just ignore. Right. So what we do is find the right person for the job. Mm -hmm. They're skilled, they're qualified, uh, they'll be with you for longer. Um, they have all of the characteristics of people with disabilities, which is they take less sick leave, they're just productive or more productive, have less workers' compensation claims. So you should be paying us for these people. Yeah. They're brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we do. So we're really trying to change that social change because the current government models, they pay you to take on a person with a disability. and. Someone shouldn't get paid to take me on. Right. Like, I'm brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, but that's what, it's that whole premise. If I, if you got paid to take me on as an employee, would mm -hmm. you immediately think that I'm worthless or I'm going to be trouble or you need all this extra support? Right. Whereas it's not the case. So we make them pay us. Wow. <laughs> Ballsy. <laughs> well, it works. And yeah. so I think we've only had one or two people actually move on from their employment uh, since we started three years ago. So really? it really shows all the statistics that we talk about and all the academic research is true and we're proving it every day. Mm -hmm. So you started this business and it's just gone gangbusters. Yeah, three, I'm three pretty years amazed. <laughs> it's amazing. I never ever thought that would happen. I had all these plans like, okay, I'll keep working, I'll pay for it to keep going. Because it was always, I don't care if I help one person get a job or 10 people get a job or a thousand people get a mm -hmm. job. I just wanted to help people get jobs. So I figured out it was going to cost me 15,000 a year to keep this website up and running. Mm -hmm. So I was just going to do that. And I, I ended up, I quit my job and within six months work on it my own and we're just getting bigger and bigger and we've got seven staff now like it's just amazing how it's good to see that what I thought was right yeah has been successful what do you think it is that has made it so successful so quickly I think just that different attitude change like we could have paid people or we could have said you should hire this person because it's the right thing to do but it doesn't change the attitudes and uh, I done a fair bit of work with Graham Innes, he used to be the Discrimination Commissioner for Disability, and it's the same thing. The, the biggest issue is that there wouldn't be an issue if employers didn't think that there was something wrong mm -hmm. with people with disabilities, mm -hmm. because they would just be hired. Right. So it's, yeah, it really is about that stigma and the attitudinal change, and we're really trying to change that, and, and we do a lot of advocacy and lobbying and things like that with the government, even though we don't have to because we're a private company. Mm -hmm. But we're in the best position to advise because we're never going to take that government money. Right. So, yeah. Yep. Do you find like you're making a bit of, like, headway? I hope so. I, I really hope so. So I know three years ago I went for a grant to help. Um, so it was an um, Innovation Connect grant, so all about innovation and new things. And I remember standing with the panel and a few of them were like, ah, mental health, oh mm. my God, this is, <laughs> people with disabilities, it's not going to work, mm. all of that sort of stuff, and doing a startup. And um, recently they've started talking about doing a, a startup accelerator for people with disabilities mm. because they're more resilient, they're more yeah. likely yeah. to succeed. Yeah, all the reasons. So, and, and also I find it easier now. Like when we started some of the conversations with some of the businesses, I was like, ooh. 
And we've got a mantra of kill them with kindness. So mm -hmm. even if they're really discriminatory or really horrible, there's no wrong question. And, and we'll work with them to work through that. But it's a really different view now. So mm. there's definitely inroads being taken. And I hope by us going out there and being so open about it and showing that you can succeed mm -hmm. will help that change that mm. attitude and stigma as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And you've, you've kind of become like a bit of a beacon for startups yeah. and, um, you know, people going into business and, you know, your, your business has succeeded so fast yeah. and so rapidly. What, what, would you, what would you say to someone who, in your position, wants to do something yeah. but is feeling a little bit terrified yeah. of failing and it not going to plan. Just to start. I think if you don't start, it's not going to happen. So mm -hmm. you just get out one step in front of the other. And I had a lot of safety nets when I did what I did, but it still it absolutely changed my life. It changed my relationships uh, with my family, with my husband, all of that sort of stuff. Absolutely everything changed. But for the better, like, I don't earn as much money as I used to. Mm -hmm. My life is totally different. But you know what? I'm the happiest I've ever been. Mm. And then my mental health is the happiest. Well, not the happiest, but it's the best it's ever been. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it, it's all about you. And, yeah, I think you need to be... The decision needs to be about you, not about the people, and, and not about how much money you can make or what you can do. I spend so much more time with my kids now. How old are your kids? They're five and four. Close together. Yeah, yeah. I have my daughter, and then we actually adopted my brother's child so that's why oh, they're wow. so close so I got oh. my own insta baby I oh. walked into the hospital and the day he was born and took him home and then went oh my god <laughs> oh, wow yeah um you just keep getting more and more amazing <laughs> everything I ask you <laughs> I mean being a mother is just like a whole other lane to being an entrepreneur yeah. and you know like coping with your own life <laughs> and you've got to cope with two other little lives and yeah. navigating that how do you find being a mum? Oh, it's really, really good. I'm, like, I, I split with my husband, but we're absolutely the best of friends, like absolute best friends. I think it's so much better. We're so much better apart. And so we do 50-50 okay. shared care with kids, mm -hmm. which means I sort of get Monday to Wednesday of the week mm -hmm. free, which I can focus on work. I can travel with work. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, we talk every day and just share the parenting. And we still do yeah. Christmases and Easter together and everything. So yeah. I, it's great. I think... That, we sh that whole saying about you need a village to raise a child, I think it's true. Yeah. I'm not advocating everyone should split with their partner, but you should find <laughs> other people to help you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Because that is the number one question for working mothers, especially, mm. is how do you do it? I mean, you feel guilty. I mean, do you feel guilty? Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And especially because Jude, um, he has more custody than I do. Okay. So, and everyone was like, how can you do that as a mother? And mm -hmm. I'm like... Well, it was always like that. I was, when I was in my old job, I was the one who worked all the time. I was the one who earned more money. Uh, he spent more time looking after the kids than me. Mm -hmm. And so it's just the same now, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that the time I have with them is anything less. And he's such an amazing father. Like I'd much rather my kids are with an amazing person and it's got nothing to do with you, male or female. It's mm -hmm. about who can provide the best care mm -hmm. for that time. But yeah, there was a lot of moments where people were like, hey, as a woman, how can you do this? Yeah, yeah, it is kind of the expected thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I don't think you have to drag yourself into the ground <laughs> just because it's mm -hmm. the dumb thing. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I used to think like that. I used to think I used to be such a martyr. Like, yeah. You know, like oh, if I don't feel completely wrecked by the end of every day, and I've like born my soul, you know, <laughs> to to my own life, then yeah. I've failed as a as a woman and yeah. a mother and an employee and all the rest of it. But it's yeah. actually not the case. Yeah, and that's why I, I really, part of me accepting my mental health was lowering my expectations, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I knew what was the best thing for my kids and, and they're amazingly happy, stable children. Yeah, yeah. you really have got it together. <laughs> God. Jessica, what's your, what's your theme song? What's, what's the song that runs in your head when you're just feeling really powerful? I have lots of mantras that work through me. Like I've got the main one that's yeah, lift as you climb, which is, I've got it tattooed on me. Oh, yeah. And then I've got my values tattooed on my back of who I am and what I'm trying to achieve. So I guess those sorts of things are what plays in my head rather than what, are, what a song. What are your values? What is it that's tattooed? Uh, so love, learning, gratitude, kindness and fairness. I love it. <laughs> I'm going to get some tattoos now. <laughs>
<laughs> I love my tatties. This was the first one. I was like, ah, oh, I'm not in the government anymore. I don't have to be all mm -hmm. corporate. And so I got this about six months ago. And I'm like, yeah, in the most obvious place yeah. you can put it. It was like a defining <laughs> moment for me. It's pretty hardcore getting a tattoo. <laughs> Have you got any? I actually do. Yeah. I actually do. On the on my ribs. Oh, and yeah. I didn't know that apparently yeah, that's, that's the most one, painful spot. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know. Talk about coming out of my body for a minute. <laughs> I, love it. I was in yeah. another place. Yeah. I was like, I was a weird person for a minute there. Yeah. I was just like, this hurts so badly. Yeah. But it's actually my brother who passed away his initials. Yeah. So I thought, this is this is for you. I'm gonna do this and you know, I felt the pain. Yeah, that was my I first tattoo. It. I had um, two cousins who committed suicide. And yeah, the first thing I did was go out and get tattoos yep. for them. And it's just, yeah, you have to do that sort of stuff. Yeah. I think that's, that's starting that process of healing. You know. Yeah. Jessica, this has been so insightful and very inspiring. I feel I feel like you were just like a superhuman. <laughs> Definitely not. No, but no. You're, you're doing amazing things for the world and doing amazing things for other people, which is the most important thing. So thank you for your work yeah, and thanks. thank you for the chat. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great. And I love that you drank the tea. I got to drink tea. I'm yeah. happy. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> thank that you. made my day. I'd only had one cup today. <laughs> oh, good. Well, we'll have another cup now. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Thank you so much.